Hello, Larry Winbolt here again with another episode to help you get a better handle on life. Today I'm going to be talking about resilience, what it is, why it's good for you and how to get some, or if you already have it, how to improve it, how to build more resilience. Now, years ago, when I was working more on a daily basis with organisations in helping, as it was called then, upskill staff, I was working in corporate training, very invested in improving the quality of life of their staff members, of their employees. But there was one thing that was taboo. I'm talking around 20 years ago or more now. And that taboo word was stress. You couldn't mention it. And then gradually, as it became more and more as a threat to productivity and people's welfare, companies were saying, well, come along and do some stress awareness training for our staff. But we only want you to deal with the stress that relates to their work. Well, obviously, quite impossible because stress is pervasive and wherever you're suffering the stressors, whether it's in your private life or elsewhere, it doesn't just affect you outside work. You bring it into work with you. So stress is stress and it's across the board if you are feeling stressed. Well, I'm glad to say things have improved since then a lot. There's been a great deal more awareness. Well, we couldn't ignore it, could we? And employers have finally woken up to the idea that stress is something they need to reduce, or the impact of stressful events, should I say. Now, there's a whole new story to this with recent events from about 2007 in the UK where I am, but also in the USA and other countries where I've had contact over those years. What with the... uh, downturn in business with the economic crisis that happened back then, 13 years ago now, and the famous austerity measures that were introduced. Those of us working in corporate training saw an immediate upturn in demand for a few topics. One of them, sadly, but not surprisingly, was bullying, because People were trying to get more with less. I mean, management systems were trying to screw more out of their staff. Perhaps screw was an unfortunate word, but companies were doing more and more with less and less, basically. And so were public sector organisations, and so was education, and there was less to go around, and there was more pressure on staff, and this was producing more and more complaints about bullying. Now, I'm not covering bullying here today. The point I'm making is that when the economic downturn happened, austerity measures came in, stress levels went up as resources went down. And one of the phenomena that I've noticed quite recently, there's a new attitude towards employers that put you under pressure, it seems to me. And it also seems to me this is a loss. This is a a step back to the dark ages almost. Back in the bad old days when employment conditions used to cause a lot of grief, industrial action, there were battles fought and won about employment conditions and working hours and what you could do and couldn't do as an employer. Now, some say that the the pendulum swung a bit too far. The tail began wagging the dog. You couldn't get rid of a staff member who was underperforming, for example. Although that wasn't true, it certainly became harder, and perhaps that's not a bad thing. I'm not here to judge that one way or the other. I'm just saying what I witnessed as a consultant going into organisations over those years. There were some big improvement in employment conditions. Minimum wage, uh, working hours directives, and so forth. But since 2007, that's all begun to 
fray a bit at the edges. And when I now go into the workplace and speak to people, and people contact me as well online and I have conversations with them about employment conditions, there seems to be a level of acceptance of what I think is totally unreasonable working practice. And my own kids, as I mentioned, my own kids talk about defending employers when I start jumping on my soapbox about employment conditions if they've not been told, for example, a week before Christmas what their work rota will be because their manager's too busy to sort out the rotors. And while I get defensive about that, the younger people say to me, look, we're lucky to have a job. Back off. It's okay. They're nice to me. What big deal. Still, I'm not here to preach employment heresy or to rabble rouse. What I'm talking about is how the landscape changed, has changed in recent years, with regard to what people, and particularly younger people, and I mean people below the age of 30, say, younger people will accept in terms of the demands made by their employers. So to rewind, 30 years ago, stress was a dirty word. Gradually, it became accepted and a topic worthy of discussion. And eventually, employers and organisations generally started to realise they had to protect their staff against the negative impact of stress that was caused by decisions taken by the management systems. And there were some big improvements, but you can't expect the employers to do it all. And we all have an individual responsibility as well for our well-being. And so, in my experience, about 10, 12 years ago, people started speaking about resilience. Now, resilience is really what we've been talking about in terms of stress management for many, many years anyway, except that, in this case, the resilience I'm talking about relates to personality factors, behaviour and characteristics in the individual, which enable you, them, the person, to build up their resilience, to bounce back. And so, really what I'm talking about here is personal resilience, personal robustness, the ability to develop grit, hardiness, these are words that also get used, which have been shown to be hugely protective of individuals, and they help us to work better under pressure, they help us to make sensible decisions. Taken together, these factors allow us to be more robust in life in general, but in particular, when we are under pressure, when we are dealing with high demand, unexpected challenge, or even with trauma. In the case of a tragic accident, loss, bereavement, or more recently, as we're seeing, the COVID epidemic, lockdown, and everything that goes with it. So if it wasn't already, resilience really has come back to the top of the agenda for most of us, whether we are, as in my case, practitioners, helping others, or whether we are individuals needing to weather difficult times. So resilience is back at the top table. It deserves recognition and attention. So in this episode, I'm going to be talking about what to do if you want to build resilience, how it helps you to understand that you almost certainly already have much of what you need. And what's more, you may find out that you're naturally more resilient in some areas of your life than others. In the sense that it's used here, resilience refers to the ability to bounce back, to function well or to recover more quickly when you're challenged by high demand, difficult events, and so forth. It's a set of characteristics which allow people to thrive and grow even during challenge or difficulty. Being resilient means you recover more easily from setback, you deal with rejection better, and that stress and pressure are easier for you to deal with. It doesn't mean 
being resilient does not mean that you have a problem-free life or that you sail through life any more problem-free than other people. Life happens however resilient you are. Your level of resilience affects how you respond to life events, how you bounce back, how you recover, and how you function when you're under pressure. It's the ability to cope with stressful events without being overwhelmed. And you can build your level of resilience by adopting habits in how you think and behave and which are known to foster resilience. And by the way, these ideas have come from large research studies. Originally, such studies were carried out in the medical services in the military, but it's spread over into daily life. And I think it came to the fore, it certainly came to my attention post 9-11, immediately after 9-11, because I was more heavily involved in the workplace then, and there was an anticipation that such an event was going to produce a huge spike in mental health difficulties in the populations most immediately concerned, that is the residents of New York, but equally the wider community. Now, of course, there were many worries at that time, and there were many people who were traumatised by events. But the expected spike in the general population didn't happen as anticipated. There were other situations where people had shown themselves to be extremely resilient. And by the way, mentioning these uh, points that we've learned from doesn't mean that I in any way deny the horror of some of these events. But if any good comes out of anything, then we should be able to learn from the people who did better in such events, psychologically I'm speaking about. And one such event or series of events, one situation, was the Holocaust, where survivors coming out of the camps, some of them, had shown greater resilience than others. Hostages were another example where people had done well while in captivity, very often in solitary confinement with a minimum of social contact, and in some cases without even a book or writing materials or anything to distract themselves or divert themselves. Under these circumstances, people should cave in, but they often don't. And it sometimes takes a crisis for people to discover just how resilient they are. Now, I'm not saying that we would all function in the same way, and of course we wouldn't, but that's the sort of thing that has driven these research studies to find out what the characteristics and the qualities are in individuals who show themselves to be most resilient. What are those characteristics and qualities that enable them to deal well with uh, adverse conditions? And when I say deal well, it doesn't mean they deal in a problem-free way. Some were still traumatised, but they got over it more quickly. And by the way, I'll just reiterate that I'm not in any way denying the horror of those situations. So resilience has been, for a generation or more, a subject of serious study. That's my point. So resilience has been well researched and there are plenty of good reasons for being resilient and for practicing the sort of practical optimism and positivity that goes with it. People have longer lives for a start, they recover more quickly from illness, Include that includes post-surgery as well by the way. They tend to have better relationships, happier relationships. They deal more constructively with perceived failure, with rejection. They are more proactive. They tend to have better social connections. They get on with people generally. And they're good at managing their emotions, particularly strong emotions and negative emotions. That's pretty useful for all of us. And if you have a high level of resilience, you're probably going to suffer less with mental health disturbance, you can recover more quickly from it, as with physical illness. You see change not as a threat, but as an opportunity to grow and learn. 
And resilient people also tend to have a high level of acceptance for the situation as it is. So whenever something happens in life that may result in loss, sudden change, circumstances you don't like, emotional arousal you're finding difficult to deal with, any of the normal life events that we all go through, sadly, and whether you have done or not, you may well do. You stand a good chance of suffering loss in your life, of possibly losing a job, losing a, a partner through their rejection of you or something more tragic. There are many, many situations where it pays us to be on top of our game and able to manage ourselves as well as possible. And that's where resilience comes in. It's often said that resilience is built on a set of learnable skills or learnable characteristics, most of which we already have, at least to some degree. And our level of resilience isn't fixed. You might see yourself as a highly resilient person. Life has proved to me that I'm resilient, very fortunately. But that doesn't mean my level of resilience stays the same whatever. I still have to look after myself. I still have to adopt healthy regimes in eating, sleeping, lifestyle habits, which, if I neglect them, if I drink too much, smoke, turn to drugs, suffer damaged relationships and don't do the repair work in myself, whatever it happens to be, my level of resilience will wane, it will diminish. And that's when I fall prey to other problems. Perhaps I start picking up more infections or I become generally my health fails in some way. So our level of resilience isn't fixed. We have to work at it. To that extent, it's not a destination it's a, or a solution. It's a way of being. And it's often said that resilience is a way, not a solution. It's a set of lifestyle choices. And there are five key areas to consider. The first of these is to cultivate what I call a resilient mindset. So it's very much about attitude and outlook. A degree of optimism helps. If you're not naturally optimistic, you can at least curb the negativity and rein it in a bit so that it doesn't wear you down and tire you out emotionally. You can nurture, in other words, your emotional resilience. You can learn who controls your moods and your feelings. And here's a spoiler, it's nobody but you. I know a lot of people think that circumstance affects how they feel about life, and that's the first big step in becoming resilient, is a level of acceptance, acceptance for the circumstances as they are, particularly when you can't change them, by the way, and acceptance for one's own level of responsibility for how one feels in life and how you get on in your relationships, dealings with other people, and so forth. Now, another alert at this point, I'm not saying, as some of those West Coast gurus do, well, I'm sure they don't all live on the West Coast of America, but um, as some of those gurus do, that uh, all you have to do is dream and you'll have whatever the universe uh, can offer you, whatever you want. You've just got to be clear about it. I don't think that's entirely untrue, but I certainly think it's bigged up to a point where it's ridiculous. What I am saying is that when you take responsibility for yourself and understand that the only thing you can control in life to any degree is yourself, then that's a big step towards learning to be more resilient. Resilient people tend to have a network of others they can count on. And quite often, this is different people for different things. So you might go to one person for financial advice, another person for relationship advice, another person for help with a DIY task, for example. You don't have to have a huge network of friends, and I'm not talking about social media friends, by I'm talking about proper friends, people you know and trust, and possibly in many cases you've known for many years. 
supportive relationships are a major contributory factor in how resilient people feel they are and how they perform in resilience tests. And the fourth point is attending to your physical well-being. Rather ironically, I think, uh, pre-lockdown anyway, we spent a lot of time and a huge amount of our own resources, financial resources, on average, in going to the gym to keep fit or in our other pastimes that keep us fit and active and out there maintaining good physical health. And yet we don't attend to our inner health, our spiritual health, our mental well-being in anything like the same way. And there's a lesson to be learned here in that resilience has to be kept up in the same way that physical energy levels and functioning, physical abilities, physical well-being have to be kept up. Resilience doesn't happen by thinking about it. It happens because you do something about it. One of those things I've just said is attending to your physical well-being. So of course that means exercise. Of course that means controlling the toxic habits that will otherwise damage your physical well-being or run a risk of impairing your health or wearing down your energies. And the day-to-day -day things that we do like drinking, smoking, socially accepted stuff, and increasingly uh, drug use. These are all debilitating factors. We know that perfectly well, and we can't pretend that that isn't the case. And yet, many, many times over the years, I've seen particularly younger people come to me suffering from anxiety or even depression. And when I ask about drug use, they just hadn't made the connection. They'd be regularly binging at weekends and then wondering why they felt like rubbish during the week or couldn't go to work on Monday morning. You know the rest. So attending to physical well-being is a very simple starting point. What I'm saying is look after your body as well as your mind. And that means physical exercise and sensible diet and all the rest of it. And finally, the fifth fifth of these characteristics which contribute to resilience, these elements, if you like, are that resilient people tend to be good at self-management. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, for a start, they understand about what stresses them, and they also understand the warning signs and what to do about it. And very often, by the way, those warning signs, of course, are emotional. You notice yourself getting irritable, or a bit tetchy with other people, or feeling less cooperative, or beginning to feel that there's a huge burden on your shoulders which you can't see your way to clear at that time. So self-management skills are another key factor. So a resilient mindset, nurturing your emotional resilience, valuing your relationships and even fostering supportive relationships. And by the way, that also means repairing damaged ones. If ongoing conflict causes you stress and grief, it needs sorting out. Attending to your physical well-being, which most people do as a matter of course anyway, and looking into how you boost your self-management skills. And in particular, that means stress and managing your emotional ups and downs which go together with nurturing or emotional resilience, which was point two I just mentioned. And a good starting point for all that is some level of self-understanding, even doing a self-assessment. For example, you can test your levels of resilience with various online questionnaires. You only have to Google it. Likewise, you know how emotionally self-aware you are. You know what your social support is like. You know whether or not your emotions get in the way and spoil your quality of life. And you also know whether you're good at identifying and managing stress or not. And that's the beauty of these learnable skills in resilience, is that we can break them down, study one at a time, do a little checklist, and make a re resolution or a commitment to improving some aspect of our lives over the next week or two and work on each in turn to gradually build up our levels of resilience.
There's a key factor among resilient people, and that is that they have a level of acceptance for events. I think this is one of the quickest ways of avoiding so much of the rubbish that we put up with in our lives. And this is mostly rubbish that we create for ourselves. And I'm not talking about empty beer tins and uh, fast food wrappers. I'm talking about the stuff that goes on in our heads. Non-acceptance of events wears you down. And most things in life we cannot control. And the vast majority we can't change either. We can't control the weather. We can't change that. We accept that. But when it comes to systems, education, employment, even politics, we rant and rave and say that it's somebody should do something. And we generally resist what is and spend a lot of time thinking and talking about what should be or what could be. I think this is one of the quickest ways that people find to make themselves unhappy. Because if your mind is full of what you haven't got, where you haven't managed to get in your career yet, what you can't afford to buy, or whatever it happens to be, all you're doing is comparing where you are now with where you dream of being or where you think you could be. And it's that gap between the now and the could be that is so draining. Whereas when we reach a level of acceptance with the here and now, the circumstance, albeit uncomfortable, difficult, frightening even, once you accept that the situation is as it is, you save yourself so much energy and so much wasted time. Now a little caveat here, I'm not saying that you should be resigned to it. You can still fight your corner, you can still fight against injustice, but just be aware that if you're complaining constantly about something you can't change, you're burning up calories, mental calories, energy, on something which is a completely pointless exercise. And when you turn to a point in your life where you are in full acceptance of things as they are, you don't have to like them, you don't have to agree with them, but you accept that this is the situation I have to deal with, then you're in a much more powerful position. Another factor that resilient people display is their ability to learn from experience. Every experience, good, bad, indifferent, provides an opportunity to learn something about yourself, about the situation, or about life in general. So resilient people tend to treat life as a learning process. And I know in my own case, I've for some reason always been resilient. I guess it's part of my upbringing. My sisters are too. So probably family characteristics played a large part in that, but not by any means all of it, because we've also built on our levels of resilience through learning from life. I know from my own case and from working with other people who consider themselves to be resilient, that when a setback occurs or an unexpected obstacle is thrown in our way, we tend to very quickly ask ourselves, right, what can I take away from this? What can I learn? How can I step back and find a way around this? So resilient people tend to be quickly thrown into a place where they are treating the problem as an opportunity to flex their creative muscles and to think about ways around the difficulty. The same thing happens with strong emotions. We can manage our strong emotions, but we can only do that as we learn about them. I spoke to a client who came to see me several months ago, who said that his relationship had broken up. He was very sad about that, but he told me that he'd accepted it and he wanted to move on. The reason he came to see me, he said, was because, in his words, he didn't want to make the same mistake twice. When I asked him what that meant, 
make the same mistake. He said, well, I don't want to go into another relationship if somehow I caused that breakup or contributed to it. I want to make sure that I'm a better person next time around. Otherwise, what's the point of starting a new relationship? I thought it was a very mature and, as it happened, resilient point of view, as he turned out to be an extremely resilient character, both in his work and in his private life. He was going through some very nasty post-divorce litigation, but he dealt with it in an extremely fair, even-handed, and I thought transparently honest way. So he was able to learn from a negative event and build it into something more positive as a learning experience. He was also able to manage his strong emotions. And he, if you like, reframed the bad situation as an opportunity to learn about himself and how to manage himself and to some extent protect himself in future. So his resilience allowed him to develop his self-management skills as well. A resilient attitude means seeing life as a learning process. Adopting an optimistic outlook, as I've said, you don't have to be a natural optimist, but do curb the negativity. To keep a proactive mindset. So if you're flawed or overwhelmed by a situation, as soon as you start to come back and feel a bit more able to face the situation and deal with it, learning to be able to break it down. And if you can't control the whole thing, just working on the bits that you can manage or you can do something about. Resilient people also tend to cultivate a positive self-image as part of their resilient attitude. Now, a positive self-image doesn't mean blowing their own trumpet, showing off or being brash or imposing in any way. In fact, they tend to be a bit quieter than the average person about their own talents and skills. But they are self-assured. They know their strengths, they know their limitations, and they're okay with that. And if they have some limitations they think could be improved on, then they do the work. I mentioned supportive relationships. Are you actively connected with others? Do you have people you can trust? Are you willing to cooperate with them? One of the things I've noticed over many years as a practitioner is that very often the people who came to see me because they'd succumbed in some way to the negative effects of stress, and quite often by this time they were off work and taking three months or six months off to, to recover from stress, because that's what had been recommended to them, not because I would recommend it, but never, that's another story. They take time off work for stress. And they had a common characteristic I noticed among all these people I spoke to over the years. And that was that they tended to over identify their own ability to sort things out. They always thought that every problem could be sorted out if they worked harder themselves. Whereas quite often, quite often we have to cooperate with others. We have to reach out. We have to ask for help sometimes. But these people didn't do that. They saw asking for help as, or they worried that asking for help would make them appear incompetent or weak. Part of good self-management means that you're able to recognize when you are becoming more vulnerable to stress and to take corrective action. And if that corrective action means getting help and support or guidance, then so be it better that than collapsing or being overwhelmed by stress. And supportive relationships also mean that you are empathetic and understanding of other people. So you're helpful towards other people as well as being empathetic, supportive of them. So by supportive relationships in terms of resilience, we mean relationships which are reciprocally respectful, trustworthy and supportive. They're not relationships of single user dependence, if I can call it that. They are, they are relationships that are balanced and honest and equal. Protecting your physical well-being, follow, following the dietary guidelines, taking regular physical exercise, your personal health and hygiene, 
those are the obvious aspects. Something that people often overlook, I think, is getting enough quality sleep. Not just being in bed long enough, but making sure that you sleep well and awake in the morning, well rested. It's been described recently that poor sleep or interfered with sleep, if I can call it that, has reached epidemic proportions in our societies. And governments are now beginning to take this seriously in terms of the health, health of the nation. It's amazing how many people suffer with poor sleep as though it's unchangeable. And yet, relatively simply, you can improve the quality of your sleep. Even if, as with the case of somebody I was speaking to recently who reckoned they had been 30 years long as an insomniac, you can still do something about it. And that's not just me speaking, that's science speaking. We are all born to sleep. And there is very little that can cause such serious problems that you are unable to sleep at all. You never lose the ability to sleep. What we do is we get into habits which interfere with our sleep. And because we believe that we can't change it, we're stuck with them. Nothing could be further from the truth. So if your sleep is in any way less good than you would like, my advice is do something about it. And if you get stuck, send me an email and I'll point you to a few resources. But certainly you don't have to suffer with poor sleep. So physical well-being relies not just on diet, exercise, personal hygiene, routine habits. It also means making sure you get the right quality of sleep and enough of it. And the recommendations are, by the way, seven to nine hours of sleep for healthy adults, whatever age they happen to be once they're past their teenage years. And finally, in this list of points to help you become more resilient, self-management, managing your own emotions, being interested enough in yourself to know that you can be better at being who you are, which means a proactive attitude. It means effective stress management skills. It means the ability and a willingness to set yourself some realistic goals in life, providing yourself with some direction based on what you think you'd like to be doing in the future. You can always change a goal, but we need to know which direction we're headed in, why we're going there, what we think will benefit, be beneficial for us in that. And finally, some thinking skills and emotional control. I think the way we think and how we think is hugely neglected in our education and in society. Any negative event can be made worse by the way we think about it. And even positive events can be ruined because we anticipate the worst outcome. Now, I'm not getting all metaphysical here, although I could, but be careful what you wish for. If your negative frame of mind is so dominant that it won't even let you see past your limitations, your perceived limitations, then you're not in a good starting place to become more resilient. And that wants reining in a little control. It's all eminently doable with a bit of guidance. And by the way, uh, check out my blog. It's all free, of course. I'm not selling anything here. www.barrywinbolt.com And just put into the search box thinking or thinking skills. There are a load of posts that will come up which will give you a starting point. I will explain in more detail what I'm talking about here. So if I had to summarise what resilient people do, first of all, focus on what you can control. Don't worry about what you can't control. Do a reality check. Are you able to accept where you are and who you are? And in so doing, decide to some extent where you need to go in life. Adopt a learning attitude. Life provides a lifetime opportunity for learning. Foster your supportive relationships and be ready to ask others for help. Whatever happens, stay calm. Don't panic. Accept things and they are as they are. And finally, if it all gets too much, and believe me, even resilient people have days like that, and you really think there's nothing to be done with a situation and it's beginning to wear you down and you think your emotional and uh, psychological well-being will suffer as a result, then know when to break off. Take a break. Distract yourself. Indulge in your favourite hobby. 
do something which changes your thinking, listen to music, do some yoga, tai chi, whatever it happens to be, resilient people have mechanisms, have resources they can turn to when all else fails in order to just get some me time, take some time out and build up the resources again. Now, there's a lot more I could say, and I would say watch this space. There'll be more on the podcast over the coming months on this sort of topic. Um, I hope you found it a useful starting point. Please remember to let me know any comments or questions you have. I'll deal with them in a future episode, but if it's of a more personal nature, I'll respond by email. And I'm always happy to set up a Skype chat if you want some guidance. And this is always a free service, by the way. I'm not flogging anything here. So I've been going on long enough. This is Barry Winterwell. I've enjoyed talking to you and I hope you found it filled in some of the gaps of your understanding about resilience. So over to you and, and from me, over and out. Goodbye.